Like many of our political institutions, city governments in this province were designed in another era, and by that we mean the 19th century. They've been tweaked and expanded, but do they need a real overhaul to meet the needs of this century? Let's ask Enid Slack. She's director of the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance at the U of T's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Zachary Taylor, director, Center for Urban Policy and Local Governance, Western University in London. And Doug Saunders, international affairs columnist for The Globe and Mail and the author of Maximum Canada, Why 35 Million Canadians Are Not Enough. Good to have you all back here at TVO tonight for this discussion. I want to start with just a little stat package here to get us set up for the discussion to come. Go ahead, Sheldon, let's bring this up. To understand the powers that cities in Canada have, you've got to go all the way back to, yes, before Canada. You see that date, 1849, the Municipal Corporations Act, which is often referred to as the Baldwin Act, established the blueprint for the system of local government that we have today, and it placed cities under the jurisdiction of the province. And at that time, 87% of Upper Canadians, as we were then called, Ontarians of course today, 87% of us lived in rural areas. That according to the census in 1851. If you go to today, that number is basically flipped. 82% of us today live in large to medium-sized cities. That is one of the highest concentrations among G7 nations. Zach, to you first. To what extent was the Baldwin Act the blueprint for the powers that cities have today? Well, the, the basic components of the Baldwin Act remain in place today across the province, with the exception of uh, the City of Toronto, which of course has its own special legislation, its own charter. Um, I, I think we need to appreciate two things about the Baldwin Act. One is that it uh, introduced uh, what's called an express powers doctrine, which means that it enumerated the powers that cities have and said you can do those things and not do anything else unless we can give you permission you to. to do them. Mm -hmm. Uh, that has changed in the last couple of decades. We, we now have what's called more of a sphere of jurisdictions doctrine, which means that municipalities can do whatever they want within certain defined areas. Um, so that's important. But there's one other good point about this, which is that the Baldwin Act uh, is really the origin point of systematic provincial supervision of local government in this province, right? What the Baldwin Act uh, in, in the decades that followed it enabled was the province to, to uh, keep its hand on the tiller with the creation of municipalities, with boundary changes, and with uh, the addition of powers, the movement of municipalities from different statuses, from township up to, sti up to city. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, it's, it's the origin of provincial supervision as well of, of local government. So in a discussion of local autonomy, that's, that's important to recognize. Note to those watching, this mm -hmm. is going to be an incredibly nerdy program. Where else can you hear about the Baldwin <laughs> Act on Canadian television? Yep. Okay, Ina, to you next. Uh, how important uh, 150, 160, 170 years ago, before Canada was even Canada, how uh, important did people think cities actually were at that time? Well, you know, if you look at the uh, British North America Act of 1867, Section 92, we're going to be nerdy here, mm -hmm. <laughs> talks about uh, the powers of the federal government, talks about the powers of the provincial government. And uh, just before saloons, taverns, and shops, comes municipal institutions. <laughs> so that gives you a, a sense of, of how important they were. I mean, cities back then didn't do that much. You know, the roads were the biggest expenditure mm. they made. Well, not very many people lived there, right? As not we very already many established. I think you've written that cities were, quote unquote, an afterthought in the 1800s when they were designed. How so? Canada developed with from, certainly from Confederation onwards for, for most of the first century with the mentality that it was going to be an agrarian country and a resource extraction country. And cities were sort of an afterthought and they almost, it's a bit of a caricature, but they almost grew by accident. A lot of the, the growth of cities came from, from people who were meant to be farmers uh, moving into cities and, and you know, e economies naturally forming. But they weren't, they weren't planned in advance to be big places that way. So this combination of, of Canada's development with cities as an afterthought. I mean, our immigration policies r from Confederation right up to the end of the Second World War almost forbade bringing urb urbanites or people with education or skills or, or entrepreneurial ambitions in. We, we, we only brought farmers, 70% hmm. uh, of whom ended up living in cities almost as soon as they'd arrived. So we, our cities were formed by luck and by coincidence rather than by design. Okay, so we've established the fact that the basic system of governance that we have today basically was set up more than 150 years ago. How well does that system, Zach, serve us today? 
I think it serves us fairly well, actually. Uh, we, we, certainly when you compare uh, the way things work to the south, south of the border, um, we see uh, quite a bit of equity across municipal boundaries. People get reasonably similar services no matter where they live. Um, people get to elect their councils and make political choices. Uh, the province uh, exerts uh, a certain role in that in, in redistributing resources, providing uh, money and grants and, and enabling legislation for, for local governments to make decisions. It's just at these, these kind of irritation points, right, where, where especially the larger municipalities uh, want to do things that are not currently provided for, and then it moves into the political realm. Let's get some feedback over here. How, a system set up more than a century and a half ago, how well does it deal with what we need to do today? Well, let me talk about the fiscal side because that's what I know best. I mean, when you look at cities even 50 years ago, uh, they didn't do the things that they are doing today. Cities deliver all the services that we use every day. I mean, it's the hard services like roads, water and sewers, but it's also um, uh, fire and police protection and ambulances and social services and social housing. And Cities need to attract skilled workers and they're competing with other cities around the world. The young, skilled workers can go anywhere. Um, so to get them to come to your city, you need to provide a good quality of life. That means a good transit system, parks, recreational facilities, libraries. All under the city's purview. All under the city's purview. And cities are facing challenges that they never faced before. Climate change. Um, you know, we need to be resilient cities. We need to deal with extreme weather events. They're not happening. These storms aren't happening once in 100 years anymore. They're happening much more frequently. We have an opioid crisis in some of our major cities. These all fall on the city. So you see these major changes on the responsibilities of cities and the expenditures they have to make. But if we turn to the revenue side, we've seen no change. So you've got property taxes as the main source of revenue for local governments in Canada, user fees, uh, and provincial transfers. And you can go back 50 years and it looks the same. So there's a bit of a disconnect here between what cities have to do and how they, the resources they have to pay for We will it. consider the issue of how that might change going forward in a second. What's your view on this issue? As well as this, there's, there's a, a built-in paradox that cities face in a lot of countries today, uh, which is that the biggest issues that are faced as national policy, strictly as national policy, or occasionally as provincial policy, uh, tend to manifest themselves almost entirely on the municipal level. Like what? For example, immigration uh, and asylum, uh, it's it, always national policy. It almost entirely manifests in cities. People, people arrive in, and settle in cities and, and probably only should, and usually in the largest cities. Most immigrants to Canada settle in the two largest city, metropolitan areas, uh, areas of Canada. And it's not Yet, really the federal government that has to house them, it's the cities that have got to figure out. It's the cities that end up feeling it, or, or at least the local offices of national or provincial governments. But it's, it happens at the local level. But not just immigration, um, even indigenous affairs in Canada. Uh, most indigenous people in Canada live in cities. Uh, yet, it's by, by no means a municipal jurisdiction. It's, uh, it's, it's a strictly a federal jurisdiction. And of course, for the band councils and, and the, and the, and the uh, indigenous nations. And you have so many other areas that, you know, drugs and things like this that are, that are national policy yet happen on the municipal level, yet municipal governments do not have generally authority over these areas. They have no ability to control these things. And they tend to not to have the resources and institutions uh, to fully deal with these things. And many countries in, face this problem. Now. In which case, do the cities need more power? Well, I think Doug is right about this. But I think one thing we need to recognize is that city governance has always been, to use a kind of fancy term, multi-level governance, right? All levels of government do urban governance, right? They all have their fingers in the pie. They all have access to different resources, different knowledge, different administrative capacities, different uh, capacities to regulate and make laws, uh, drawing out of their constitutional jurisdiction and so on. So I, I think when we, we mix up these words local and urban and municipal, uh, I think we're, we're actually doing a disservice to the fact that we've, we've always had multi-level governance in cities. The question is, are those, the things happening at the different layers and the way they come together right or not? Well, l let's do one example. There's been a big debate in this city for 10 years about whether they should build a subway in Scarborough. Yeah. Right? Yep. The city makes the decision. It's mm -hmm. the federal and provincial governments that help flow the money to help pay for it. 
right? But yep. the deciders yep. are the city. And they've made many different decisions. And they have indeed over the <laughs> years. But would you say that's an example where the cities need even more, even more power and more authority to either raise the funds to I think, pay for these well, things? Well, I think we need to separate three different issues. Okay. We need to separate legal authority, which is one kind of power. We need to se separate that from own source resources. What does that mean? The taxes you can raise yourself, okay. as opposed to money being given to you Transferred, from, okay. from, from another level of government. And third, which I think is what motiv what's motivating our discussion today, is the desire of, of urban people in municipalities to be protected from arbitrary action from other levels of government. Right. Give me an example of that. What would that refer uh, to? Well, uh, reducing the number of wards in the city of Toronto in the middle of an election. There you go. There you uh, go. Fairly so so uh, I think we're mixing these things together. OK, let me focus then. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm going to try not to be mixed up for a change on the program. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see if we can separate these things. <laughs> Enid, following up on what you said a second ago, all that long laundry list of responsibilities that cities now find that they have that they didn't have in the days of the Baldwin Act, you would like them presumably to have more fiscal autonomy. That's right. What does that look like? Well, what that looks like is, is other tax sources that the cities can count on. You know, the cities, I said, to provide a range of services. One of the things they're delivering is social services. The property tax is not the best way to pay for social services. That's a redistributive function. The income tax works a lot better. You know, the, the city of Toronto has a budget, operating budget's about 13 billion, add another three or four billion for capital. That's larger than half of Canada's provinces. Yep. And yet they have property taxes, <laughs> user fees, and transfers. So I think given the range of services they provide, they should have access uh, to other taxes, like income taxes, sales taxes. Sorry, they should have ac be able to apply their own or have access to? Um, not, not quite either. So, so I don't think they should go out and levy their own income tax. That's administratively very costly and, and difficult to do. Okay. But they should have the ability to levy a rate on top of the provincial income tax. So Toronto may say, well, we'd like to add 2%. Another city might say half a percent. Another city might say 1%. So the province collects it and then flows it to the city. Right. But it would be the city that would determine the tax rate, rate. Because they would say, this is what we need to deliver services, speak to its taxpayers, and then say, and this is the amount of money we're going to raise to collect it. The, the province would just be the collecting agency. How do you like that idea? There are cities that have the power to levy income tax, municipal income tax ex exists in some places. There are also cities, including major European cities, that have no tax raising ability of their own that rely entirely on direct transfers from national or, or state governments. Uh, and um, it's hard to say when you, when you visit the governments of these, of these different cities that, that one model is better than the other. However, uh, Certainly cities being starved of resources when they're the, the central places is important. And Enid's analysis has found that cities in Canada uh, have far less authority and, and ability to finance the decisions they make than other cities in, in, in other countries in the Western world. So I think we, ha we, have, we have a problem that can be addressed either by, by increasing the revenue abilities uh, of, of cities or by making them not cities anymore, uh, which is, I think, something else that's, that's in the air and is being discussed. Do you change a city so that it's not a city anymore, so that it's something more like a province and has those powers that they want? Or do you keep it a city and you make sure it has what it needs, maybe not because not through its own municipal government, but through local offices okay. of federal and provincial Hold off government. on that, because we're going to get there. We're going to get there, but we're not there yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. The notion of cities needing more uh, autonomy, however you want to define that, what's your view? What is autonomy, right? I mean, I think this goes back to my, my previous point. We can give cities more legal powers, right? More legal authority to do things. But if they don't have the fiscal resources to do them, okay, well, then legal, the, legal authority is meaningless. Taking right? its example, should the, should the city of Toronto, city of Ottawa, city of Mississauga, big cities in this province, should they have the right to go to the provincial government and say, add two points on the income tax because we need that money to pay for that whole laundry list of things we talked about earlier? I think there's a couple of issues with that. One is that uh, places with lots of wealthy people will do well with that, and places that are in decline will not do so well with that. There will also be intense political pressure at the local level to not raise taxes. We don't live in, a, in an era where, where that's a, a particularly popular option. And uh, the idea of creating a higher tax zone in one place that's next to lower tax zones 
could lead to people leaving, right? And we, we already see that happening with property taxes. How about that? Well, yeah, I mean, those are good points, but that raises the issue of what is the taxing authority and can you give the tax to the city of Toronto, the city of Mississauga, the city of Ottawa? And I think it needs to be done on a regional basis. It becomes a governance question. So you're right, if we had a sales tax or an income tax in the city of Toronto and not in the neighboring municipalities, people would respond to that. They would move or shop in the other jurisdictions. That's an incentive That's, to keep taxes lower then. It is. Um, but if we did it on a regional basis, there would be less slippage, you know, outside those boundaries. So it brings up the governance question, and, and I think that's an important one. How do you deal with, I mean, here's the bottom line. Nobody wants to pay more taxes, whether it's a hotel tax or an amusement tax or, you know, when you go to the, uh, what they used to call the Air Canada Centre, what do they call it now? Sco Scotiabank Arena. <laughs> Nobody wants to pay an additional tax on tickets to go to hockey. Nobody wants to pay more tax. And yet you're saying there are billions of dollars of need out there for which more revenue is simply necessary. Right. How do we deal with that? It's difficult, isn't no it? No kidding, yeah. <laughs> because politicians have to get elected, and, yep. and it's very hard to say, I'm raising your taxes. And, you know, I, th I think it comes down to linking the taxes to the expenditures. It comes down to what kind of city do we want? What kinds of services do people want? And now this is how we have to pay for them. You have to, you have to make that link. And I think when people see the link, I think if people see roads being improved, they might not be so much against having road tolls. I think if they see the transit system being improved, they're happy to pay for it. I think you, you have to deliver on those services before you can ask for more money. You have to prove that it's going to something that people want. Uh, like it's I still hard. I don't want to be snooty here, Doug, but you know, we, we often hear, for example, Premier Ford says this, you know, a lot of people who live in downtown Toronto and who are doing okay are all for higher taxes on suburban commuters who have to come into the city for their jobs because they're the ones who pay the taxes and the people who live downtown don't. How do you get around that? Property taxes is a tricky instrument this way. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Toronto, of course, pays very low property tax. Relatively uh, speaking. Uh, my parents live, in, my parents live yeah. in Hamilton and they pay a uh, vastly more property tax than I do, for example, on residential. And you get these wars between jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's, it's why I think the, the amalgamation and expansion of cities in, in Ontario and other places in Canada was probably a wise idea and probably should have extended further uh, because you, wa you want to watch out for these business tax wars between suburban jurisdictions, which don't have to bear the costs of social services and things like that. Uh, and as much. As much. Right. And down, I mean, if somebody runs into drug troubles or something like that, they usually end up downtown. It's usually, it's usually the, the inner cities that end up, end up paying these, these high social costs. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, the suburban areas can levy them more. So uh, on the other hand, one of the solutions that, that we've seen in other cities is, is specific fees and tolls. London, UK, solved uh, a lot of its transit funding problems by instituting an electronically generated fee of a, the equivalent of about $20 per day for anyone who wants to drive downtown. And now fewer any, people do. On any road. It reduced the amount of traffic. It, it provided some funding for mm -hmm. public transit. Now, in Ontario, of course, that was attempted by uh, Mayor John Tory, a, a much simpler version, a simple road toll on the Toronto-owned uh, Gardner Expressway, and, and that was vetoed no. by the Liberal Premier. So mm -hmm. these jurisdictional wars between cities that are large enough to have province-like population clout and political clout and economic clout and the provinces that they are wards of are, are always going to be big tensions and I think they've, they've reached a certain peak in Ontario mm. at the moment. Let's play a clip here. This is, just check the monitors out here in the studio. This is Benjamin Barber, author of If Mayors Ruled the World. And he was on our summer program in 2014 with Pia Chattopadhyay. Go ahead, Sheldon, go. Perhaps the most important difference between mayors and prime ministers, between mayors and presidents, between city councillors and cabinet members of a national government is that in cities you've got to solve real problems. Pick up the garbage, plow the snow, keep kids coming to school, make sure there are enough jobs for folks. If they're illegal uh, and undocumented workers, figure out how you're going to deal with them because you can't throw them out, they're there. Dealing with real problems and finding real solutions. And that makes mayors pragmatists and problem solvers and allows them to deal with the real issues of governance that people in national government, the prime ministers and presidents, simply don't have to and don't do. 
Zachary, your take on that argument. Mayors and cities are at the bottom line of everything, therefore they should have more powers to deal with these things. It makes sense as far as it goes, but I think uh, the late uh, Benjamin Barber um, uh, tends to kind of fetishize the, the benign autocrat, right? The Michael Bloomberg, the, the American strong mayor um, who can uh, wave magic wands and get things done. We don't have strong mayors in Canada. We have talked about them. Doug Ford says that just, he would like to have them. Explain, when you say strong mayor, uh, you mean a mayor that can veto the decision of a council. Exactly. As opposed yep. to just be one vote yep. out of 20 or whatever. And have the entire city bureaucracy report directly to the mayor mm -hmm. instead of council as a whole and so on. Have a much broader scope of autonomy to just act as an individual. Would you prefer um, that system? Uh, I think it, uh, uh, it definitely makes things more efficient in terms of getting things done. But a lot depends on who's sitting in that role, mm -hmm. right? And we don't, uh, unlike many of these American cities that have strong mayors, we don't have political parties uh, that, that have kind of a vetting and primary process that, that uh, kind of air the sort of person you're going to get before they get elected into office. Um, so I, I think there's risks to that, and I'm, I'm not sure we could just adopt it out of whole cloth. What do you think, mayors, mayors having more power because they're the ones who are at the base of it all at the end of the day? Oh, I think it's appealing. Um, I, I mean, he, uh, uh, Benjamin Barber talked about all the services that, that are delivered. And, uh, you know, for, for most people, they encounter city services every day. You know, from the moment you wake up and have a shower to go out on your sidewalk, take out your garbage and get on the transit system. These, these are frontline services and, and they have to work. And, and so, I, you know, I think city councils and the mayors are, are very important. What about the notion, Doug, that cities know better what they need, better than, say, provincial cabinet ministers, federal cabinet ministers? What's the evidence say on that? <sighs> yes and no. There's, there's another paradox here, uh, which is that governments become less accountable, more open to corruption, somewhat less democratic as they become more local because I mean, for example, most people know who their MP is. Few people know who their city councillor is, except in special circumstances. Um, the MP has all sorts of well-funded big institutions of accountability and oversight, has many media watching her, uh, has, uh, has a, 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 a lot more monitoring and, and oversight, less options for corruption. Uh, as you move down in levels of government, that becomes less true. You have less oversight, less, less watching, and so on. Um, and so you, you don't necessarily want to be throwing a lot of money at a level of government that isn't, that isn't necessarily set up to have that sort of cloud. So there's two solutions to this problem. One is to make cities more powerful institutionally so they actually have that greater degree of democracy and, and, and oversight and so on. I mean, the city of Hamburg in Germany, for example, the, the mayor of that city is what we'd call a premier. It's a, it's, it's a province and has, has uh, that sort of power and so on. The other, the other is to keep cities cities, but to, have, uh, to increase the amount of resources being provided to them through the provincial and federal governments there, which sometimes happens when cities become politically important hmm. uh, for the party in power winning office. Okay, he mentioned Hamburg, Germany. You've looked at other cities around the world vis-a-vis -vis how much power their municipalities have to do the jobs required. What have you found? Well, we, we did a study at the Institute on Municipal Finance and Government compared in eight major cities around the world. And Canadian cities, we looked at Toronto in particular, um, depend on, on grants less than, than many cities around the world. Um, but have much fewer sources of revenue. So we looked at New York and Paris and Tokyo. They, they all have, you know, New York has 20 different taxes it can levy. I'm not saying that's a good model, mm -hmm. but it does have, you know, personal income, corporate income, sales taxes, and a number of other taxes the it can levy. The municipality. The municipality, yeah. Doesn't seem to have held back New York's growth. Um, right? Having all those taxes in place? I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. Again, I wouldn't recommend all of these taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, a city like Berlin, Berlin is interesting. Um, it's a city-state, so it has the powers of a city government and a state government. That means it has the revenues of a city and a state government. Um, but again, it has a lot of different taxes. I don't recommend a beer tax necessarily or a dog <laughs> tax like they have, but they do have access to, to income taxes. They don't have much money anyway. 
and they don't have much money anyway. Um, you know, when you when you look at the Nordic countries, they're, they're very interesting because, uh, of course, they're not federal countries. They don't have provincial or state governments, just a national government and local governments. Local governments do a lot of social services and, and health care, uh, but they have income taxes. So you have that good matching of progressive taxes with, with social services. So, so I would say when you look at Canadian cities, they have much fewer tax sources uh, than the major cities around the world. In which case, let's come full circle and finish up on the notion you raised a little earlier, which is, would things work better in the major cities of this country, let's take the capital city we're in right now, if they were their own provinces? What do you think? On paper, <laughs> uh, it might not be better. I mean, Jane Jacobs, the great urbanist, argued that, that metropolitan regions should become their own provinces with their own currencies because each economic unit should have its own mm -hmm. base and so on. It, kind of eliding around the question of what happens to the rest. And, and I think Z Zach has addressed this question, what happens to the rest of the province? I mean, if you cut metropolitan Montreal out of Quebec or, or greater Vancouver out of BC, or if you count, if you cut Toronto and, it, and its suburbs in, in, in York and, and Peel and Durham regions out of Ontario, you have a have and a have not uh, situation. If you, if you had a province of metropolitan Toronto, that would be a mighty province. Toronto funds and subsidizes the rest of Ontario in certain ways. The rest of Ontario does not believe that. The facts say otherwise, but the rest of Ontario does not believe that. This is true in many places. I, I, I don't think upstate New York feels grateful to New York City for being subsidized by yeah, it precisely. either, right? Let me get, I got a minute left to go here. Let me get your view on Toronto as a province. Well, it'll never happen. <laughs> our also. constitutional order is our constitutional order. So I don't think we, we need to really discuss that at all. Um, I, the, the bottom line point for me is going back to this notion of multi-level governance of cities, mm -hmm. is that when the system works well, the province and the federal government create, give local governments tools to solve problems they protect them from doing bad things, right? Uh, they create an enabling framework. Uh, and when the system works well, it works really well. We've been very successful in this country uh, up, to, up to this point. We have these flashpoints, these moments like we're having right now between Toronto and Ontario um, that, uh, uh, that I don't think should cloud our longer historical perspective on how successful we've been compared to American cities. And it's, we have to say it's not unique. Yeah. I can recall 47 years ago, a certain Premier of Ontario cancelled a certain Spadina Expressway, which now doesn't go through Enid Slack's backyard. <laughs> and the city was very upset, but the province said that's the way it's got to be. There's nothing new under the sun. That's Zachary Taylor. No, not the former American president, but rather a professor <laughs> at uh, Western University, director of the Center for Urban Policy and Local Governance there. Enid Slack from the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Doug Saunders. You want to read more? Maximum Canada, Why 35 Million Canadians Are Not Enough. That's one of about 85 books that Doug has written for your viewing pleasure. Thanks, everybody. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.